In the last section, I shared my belief that the number one barrier to people experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit is pure natural talent that we're born with. How huge churches have been created by really skilled people. But the success of those ministries may have very little to do with the power of God because the Holy Spirit isn't needed when there's a team of talented human beings. Then we learned the three ways that the Bible teaches to be baptized in the Spirit. First, those times when God just shows up, when it's completely unexpected. Or those times when we ask for it, desire it, and we ask God in a prayer to baptize our minds, our hearts, and the fire of the Holy Spirit. Then finally, when we're commissioned for a specific ministry by the elders laying hands on us and praying for us. But as we talk about spiritual power and spiritual gifts, you might be wondering about the elephant in the room. What about skills and talents? Are they bad? Are they evil? Are we not to use our talent at church? If it's the Lord's job to build the church, then is there no place for my natural abilities? The answer, absolutely there is. Your natural aptitudes are a wonder created by God. He wired you with them from before the time you were born. Look at what David wrote about how God wired him together. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Most of us have probably seen a child virtuoso, a young prodigy with inexplicable talent. Well, notice this child is just four years old living in China which probably means he's not a Christian. It means sadly this child doesn't yet have the Holy Spirit, at least not yet. Well, pause for a quick moment. If this child were playing the piano in a church, what would people be saying? If he performed on a stage in a church on a Sunday morning, people would be likely mistakenly saying that he has a spiritual gift of playing piano. Nope. This kid is just fat, talented. He's not even a Jesus follower yet, so he can't have a spiritual gift. He was just fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together in his mother's womb with a natural inclination, an innate genius to play the piano. Well, pause. Do you know who else had a natural talent for music? It was King David. And from David's story, we're going to see just how powerful a natural skill can be and how that skill can be transformed by the Holy Spirit into a spiritual gift. We'll pick up the story when David is just a young man, still watching sheep in his father's fields in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now the spirit of Yahweh had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahweh tormented him. First, notice as we talk about natural ability, it's still within the context of the spirit world because that is the context in which we all live. Our practice, our earthly skills and talents, we are all surrounded by a very spiritual war. Well, Saul's attendants said to him, see, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. Notice Saul's attendants, they're not looking for a spiritual ability or some spiritual gift. They're simply hoping for a talent, for a skilled musician who can play mood music to relax the king. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. This is a Jewish lyre, or, or what is called a kenor. It was kind of a harp, lute, hybrid, and even today is considered the national instrument of the Jewish people, mostly due to the famous talent of King David. But David didn't just pick up this instrument and play it by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
It was a skill he had to learn, probably sitting in the fields, passing time, watching the sheep for his father. Now, obviously, David had a natural aptitude for playing music, but he honed that skill and practiced over the years until this moment he was brought before the king to soothe him with mood music at the suggestion of King Saul's attendants. And this brings us to a key discussion on the differences between natural talents and spiritual gifts. Some key distinctions. Distinction number one, everyone has talents while only Jesus followers can have spiritual gifts. Anyone with a family that has a talent for something can acquire and develop that same talent. In contrast, spiritual gifts are acquired only by those who receive Jesus as their savior. It may have nothing to do with the spiritual gifts of other Christ followers in their family. Distinction number two, talents are genetically inherited while spiritual gifts are received. For example, a woman inherits her father's singing voice, and that's why she's so great at singing. Or a man inherits his mother's talent in writing and communication. Well, these are natural talents that are passed down from generation to generation in a family. Distinction number three, people are born with talent while spiritual gifts are received when someone is baptized in the Spirit. Remember back to the prepositions. The disciples all possessed talents they'd been born with when Jesus told the disciples the Holy Spirit was with them. When Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was in them and they became the temple of the Holy Spirit, they still had those natural talents. But in the book of Acts, when they were baptized in the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came on them. That is when, for the very first time, they received and functioned with a spiritual gift given by the Holy Spirit. Distinction number four, talents are developed and predictable, while spiritual gifts are matured and unexpected. With hard work and practice, natural talent can be developed. While a spiritual gift is not affected by practice, talents are predictable and that the more a person practices a skill, the better they'll get. While spiritual gift is surprising and that the person is already good at it right away, even if they've never been trained for it because it is the spirit working through them and it's not dependent upon the person's skill. Spiritual gifts are not developed but rather matured as we face trials of various kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. People who mature in their spiritual gifts are those people who've learned to surrender every ounce of self in the use of their spiritual gifts, functioning in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with zero pretension or self-glorification, but only to the building up of others in the body of Christ and the spread of the kingdom of God. And relating to this maturing of our spiritual gifts is the next distinction number five. Talents are useful for common issues. Spiritual gifts are necessary for the extraordinary. When it comes to the everyday issues like putting a budget together or balancing a checking account for a ministry, talent and skill, plenty good enough. And it's perfectly fine just to leverage the skills of people with a natural aptitude for finances. But when you're facing a financial crisis as a ministry or trying to balance demands of where to invest limited resources for kingdom size impact, you better rely upon people with the spiritual gifts of administration, discernment, and wisdom. If you're trying to draw a crowd on a Sunday morning to your church, talented musicians and singers are really helpful and useful. But if your goal is to draw people into the very throne room of God, to pray in one voice before Almighty God, you better have some people functioning with the spiritual gifts of prophecy and and worship leadership. Well, that's the difference between an incredible worship band at church versus actually encountering the very presence of God. Distinction number six, talents naturally build ourselves up while spiritual gifts naturally build the church up. Talents are most naturally used for personal achievements alone and not to build up others. Talents tend to draw attention to us as people and cause people to appreciate and glorify us. 
But spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of glorifying God alone. Thus, it is natural for spiritual gifts not to bring glory to us, but to build up other people, to build up the church, ministering to others, and bring glory to God. That's not to say we can't abuse spiritual gifts and misappropriate their use to bring ourselves glory and honor. I mean, just read the letters Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. I mean, Paul rebuked them for embezzling spiritual gifts for personal gain and reputation. Well, how did they get it so wrong? Because instead of recognizing the purpose and power of spiritual gifts, they were obsessed with signs and wonders rather than functioning according to biblical standards. Now the final distinction is one almost no one teaches, but I believe it is so critical when it comes to discovering the ministries in which we should serve. Distinction number seven, talents reveal where we should serve, while spiritual gifts determine our effectiveness. You've probably not heard another pastor say this, but I believe it's 100% true. The most important factors in calling and choosing what ministries to get involved in are your personal talents and passions, not your spiritual gifts. Now, we'll be talking about passions in the next session, but spiritual gifts are not where to start discovering where to serve. Why do I say this? Because it doesn't matter what your spiritual gift is. I believe every ministry in the church or in the community or across the world needs every spiritual gift functioning to be most effective. Here's what I mean. If someone has a spiritual gift of teaching, most often they take a, a test, discover that gift, and immediately they're plugged into a ministry like kids ministry. Because of course, kids ministry always needs teachers. But that person may have zero talent with kids. They may have zero passion for kids. And I would argue kids ministry, they need people with this other spiritual gifts, gifts of administration and leadership, or the gift of mercy or the gift of encouragement, just as much as they need people with the gift of teaching. When we start with spiritual gifts being the determining factor as to where people should serve, then we end up siloing the same spiritual gifts together in isolated areas rather than spreading out all the gifts of the Spirit into the various areas of ministry in the church. Back to the life of David. Look at 1 Samuel 16 verse 18. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and Yahweh is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. I want you to notice something here. It wasn't a spiritual gift, but rather David's musical talent that got him into the right place for ministry. He was skilled at playing the lyre, so that is where it was natural for him to serve. Don't forget what we've learned. Natural born talent, it's from God too. God knit David together in his mother's womb with the natural ability to play and write music. We're gonna follow the same model with Wired. We're gonna start with your God-given talents. Both spiritual gifts and natural talents are God-given. That means that these are blessings that our Lord God has imparted to us. God is our creator, and it is through Him that we all receive different abilities and talents. So start there. What are you naturally good at? What skills have you worked on to develop? Now, some of you probably know without a doubt what you're good at because your talent has been tried and true. But some of you? are probably still searching a bit. While some of you might have some untapped hidden talent or skills, you have no idea that you have the potential to thrive in. And some people are unaware that something that comes easy to them and they don't think is that special or powerful is actually a talent. That's why the talent inventory is such a critical part of the wired assessment. Talent is the first data point in what we'll call the calling equation. A calling is the task ministry or role God has wired you to serve in. So the calling equation is a pretty simple concept. Spiritual gifts do not lead to your calling. Instead, here's the math. Talent plus passions times the still small voice of the Holy Spirit equal your calling. That task, 
ministry or role God has wired you to serve in. So talent, it's half the equation. God wired right there these natural abilities right into you. So if you haven't completed the wired assessment before the next session, make sure you take the talent inventory section. If you do, or if you've already completed the whole wired assessment already, then you're done, you're ready. And then continue to the next session where we're gonna look at the second half of the equation, your passions, and why they too are a key to discovering your calling.